so hi, i'm mike i work for a company called bbd software in the research and development team i'm not quite sure what i'm supposed to be doing there but they keep paying my salary and it's all working out i'm also a co-organizer of the javascript user group josie.js so i'll probably shamelessly plug that a little bit later some more um, and I, I talk about JavaScript professionally and in the community quite a lot, despite working in a number of languages and paradigms. I really love JavaScript and the web. I mean, a lot, a lot. So, so much so that I worry that I've got a little bit of a reputation that's developing that's, that's parallel towards the, the ancient aliens guy, right? <laughs> okay, but, but anyway, so moving past that point. Let's talk, about, let's talk about the internet. I'm, I honestly believe that the, the World Wide Web is probably the greatest invention of mankind. We've codified all of our knowledge and made it publicly available, cheaply accessible to everyone. Um, and I mean, it's a, it's a massive, massive feat. There are centuries worth, there's centuries worth of video content alone to be able to watch through that, that you, wouldn't, you wouldn't possibly be able to get through. Um, and this thing is, it connects people that would previously never ever have been connected. But now, it, it's also, it's, it, as a movement, it's not a finished product. It's not a thing that you can target and be done with, right? It moves on. It constantly moves on. So the, the challenge that we had is that originally when this thing was created, we, we, it blew up. And people did stuff with it, but they weren't really sure what they should do with it. So the people who were in charge of coming up with what, well, should be done, what should be the standard of the internet, tried to build in what people were doing at that point in time. And people were exploring it, right? They were trying to figure out what they could do with it. So web standards built in blink tags and marquee tags. And people wrote JavaScript that followed your mouse cursor because what else were you going to do with this stuff? They had no idea. They didn't think about the future. A lot of this stuff still works in browser. The only thing that doesn't is the blink tag. Why they left the marquee tag and took the blink tag out, I'm not entirely sure, but that's it. All right, so what are we actually going to talk about? Or what, what happened then next? Because people looked at these toys and they decided that the, the toys were really, really cool, but we needed to build stuff on a solid platform going forward. So we created plugins. And the first and foremost amongst those was Flash, right? That let us build higher order things to go forward. Right, a stable thing that could reach everyone, that we could build serious software on. Um, and you're going to have to forgive me about mixing up the timelines, much like uh, the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe versus comic books here. Right, It's going to get weird, uh, but just bear with me. And, th and then moving on from that, at some point in time, there was a real momentum shift. And it, it, it broke down to three primary parts. And they, they're not consecutive in the order that I'm talking about them in. But it is the, the releasing of a book called JavaScript, The Good Parts by Douglas Crockford which is really a seminal piece which spoke about the bits of the language that were really, really awesome and that you could do awesome things with. From a performance perspective, the release of the V8 engine that powers Chrome was, was a pivotal moment because suddenly you had Grant to do things more than just build toys, right? And then more than that, a really, really important thing was this project called jQuery, which basically took all of these disparate browser idiosyncrasies and gave you one platform to access the DOM with, one platform to write uh, applications off of. And what people did with that, once they could reliably work with JavaScript and the DOM, is they built higher order components. I bet you most jo websites that you still work with have a jQuery date picker as the date picker component, right? Something along those things. Um, so the plugins ended up being these, these parts that you could just include in your application would just work, let you compose applications rather than engineering it from the ground up for one browser. Now, why have we gone through this route? Well, because that's where we enter the Polymer project. So the Polymer project is not just a framework. It's an attempt to try and figure out where the web is going. How are we going to one day build applications? And how do we make sure that we build the libraries and frameworks today that allow us to natively build those applications in the future? Okay. And also think about how, how we look at our frameworks. Because now we look at jQuery in the, in the pejorative, right? It's, it's dead. It now needs to be extricated from our frameworks because the JavaScript has evolved. The web platform has gotten stronger. All the things that jQuery can do, the web platform, the browsers are better at doing natively. So we need to relook at how we do that so that we don't have that problem going forward. And I think more importantly, like 
we've been playing catch up from a standardization perspective. This stuff exists because the, the, the standards process of the, the World Wide Web Consortium works really, really slowly. It takes a long time to get things ratified. Um, and they wanted to basically give it a shot of adrenaline in the right direction, acid test a whole bunch of ideas to inform it before it was too late to move this big ship. So basically, this all comes down to the idea of building these higher order components, web components, that the people at the Polymer team, the smart, smart people at Google, decided that they wanted to build a thing that facilitated web components, that created it, and made, made it work, and saw if it could work and inform the standards. All right, so let's talk about a little bit of history. So in about November 2014, they released 0.5 of the Polymer project, which was an elaborate experiment, basically. Hey, here's the idea of how we think web components could work. Can they work? You know, is this a thing that we can use? Is this how we see the future of the web? Um, and it was cool, and a lot of people were like, oh, wow, that's nice and exciting. But there's no way I'm writing production code with that. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to support that stuff. So they realized very quickly that they didn't have a strong use case to try and convince um, browser manufacturers to, to, to adopt web components as a standard, to take this stuff seriously. So they released 1.0 as a production-ready framework, which was awesome in 2015. And they took a whole bunch of shortcuts to be able to do that. And then they, they realized at some point in time that they needed to, to make this thing more modular, you know, um, to, to make it a, a real grown-up framework. And that took them about two years. And Polymer 2.0 shipped in May this year, the, the first version. Okay? Um, and then the real surprising part is that a few months later, they said, well, okay, cool, now this is what we're going to do for Polymer 3. And, you know, typical corporate developers, everybody goes, wait, what? What happened to two? You just released it, right? And what happened between those two dates? And what happened between those two dates is not between May and August. It's between 2015 and 2017. The web as a platform has evolved from 2015 so far. And there's so many more things that we can do today. And they need to then cast their gaze forward again and figure out where we're going to be in two years' time so we can start informing that stuff. So why should you care? Because I guarantee almost everybody in this room has used uh, a Polymer application today, if not this, or, and if not today, this week. Okay? Chrome uses Polymer for all of its settings pages. Google uses it for Google Music. Does anyone use Google Music here? Right, Google Music Web uses Polymer. Who's watched a YouTube video today? Okay? That's all Polymer. Who plays games? Polymer. Who watches Netflix? Polymer. Okay, maybe I'll make the point if I show it. That is all polymer. Everything there is polymer. Everything there is polymer. Everything there is polymer. I'm not going to show you my Chrome Downloads page because you're going to judge me based on it. And <laughs> definitely not history. All right, so, so hopefully I've, I've made a case that this is, this is not some hipster fringe framework that we're talking about here. Some of the biggest corporates in the world have decided to put their, their money behind this put their effort behind it. Why? Because they believe in higher order components. And in fact, they have to make it work. They can't rebuild this stuff every couple years. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go into the specifics. So I'm going to show you some Polymer 2 code just so we can get some feature parity before we show what Polymer 3 is and where the web is going. So basically, this is just your index.html page. And the first thing that you'd need to do is load a polyfill, right? Which is web components to say, well, I want to declare custom elements. Now, that comes from Bauer. Um, you'll then use something called, in Polymer 2, an HTML import that says, well, I'm going to link to an HTML file and treat it like an important module that Web Components understands. Thereafter, you treat it basically just like a custom element, okay? like anything else on the HTML page. And you can add properties and stuff and go wild. So behind the scenes, what that element actually is, is it's got a couple more HTML imports, which, again, fetch. Some, some dependent libraries, transient dependencies from Polymer. It then uses a web component itself, which is DOM module, to declare this thing where it dictates, well, no, the component's going to be called Hello World. We then have a template, which is HTML standard. This is, this is everywhere now. Um, the only thing that's different about this is that you'll see that there's square braces around name, which dictates a one-directional data binding into name. So name's going to be substituted by something. We'll then use standard ES6 or ES2015, sorry, classes. Um, that's in all of JavaScript at the moment um, to extend off of. That's what we imported at the top of the page. We'll then do two things. We'll declare our uh, hello world element 
this is what its identity is, and we'll have, give it a properties hash. And this is a very JavaScripty way of saying, well, these are the things that it represents, okay? And the last part we do is we once again define what the custom element is. So we say, well, this is how we, we make the DOM realize it using our shim. All right, so there's a lot of repetition, a lot of talking about custom elements um, and what it is. So if we take a look at the pros and cons of where Polymer 2 is, firstly, it's all idiomatic HTML, which is really, really cool. It's all just HTML. Um, a con is that it uses Bower. Now, if anybody is a web developer here, they'll know that Bower is a swear word at the moment. On the Bower blog, they recommend not using Bower as your package manager. <laughs> use something else, don't use us. So that's a real con. <laughs> Um, and then there's lots of repetitive IDs. They're talking about Hello World over and over again in that example. And then HTML imports is the real deal breaker because um, web components, a whole bunch of the other stuff has been ratified as V1. The W3C has said they're not going to ever do HTML imports. So something has to change. Enter the future, Polymer 3. So the first part is really, really similar where you're linking to the shim because web components aren't native yet. Uh, sorry, polyfill, let me not confused terminology. Uh, and the only thing you'll notice there is that we're not getting it from Bower anymore. We're getting it from NPM using flat modules, which is a relatively new feature. We're then using a JavaScript ES6, or sorry, ES2015 import, which is a module import. Now, um, we'll talk about the support later on, but this is all native in Chrome, which is pretty cool. And then the usage of the component is exactly the same. Right? It's just an HTML element. It's a higher order component that we care about. Behind the scenes, we're now talking about JavaScript rather than HTML. We've got an, again, import, import this poly, polyfill, um, which is using ES 2015 imports rather than HTML imports, which won't exist. We then go straight to classes, right? We create our Hello World class, which extends Polymer element, and then we have two parts to it. So the first part is we dictate our template. So this is using a feature from ES 2015 called JavaScript template literals, which is basically string interpolation I mean, I'm sure everybody's worked with some form of string interpolation or string format. This just returns a string, which is pretty awful. Okay, but we'll, get, we'll address that in a minute. The second thing is the properties hash, which is exactly the same. Um, and lastly, we just de define the hello world custom element the once. Okay. So let's look at a little bit more of a complex, complex scenario, because that's, I mean, that's the, the really, really entry point. So if we take a look at one with some bidirectional data binding, and forgive me, I'm going to jump around a bit here. So firstly, we need to tell Polymer that there's going to be some additional magic. It's not one direction anymore. So we have to say, well, cool, you're going to notify stuff with observer pattern. We then, you can see that on line seven, the hello is still using the square brackets. But on line nine, we're now using the curly brackets, dictating that I'm going to get some feedback from you and send you some feedback. Now, this is just a raw HTML input element. So we need to give it a little bit of extra um, information as to what we want to trigger on, which is why we specify the change event. But that only works when, you, or that's only a problem when you're dealing with raw elements at the moment. When you're dealing with higher order components, like this paper input, which is the official material design input checkbox, or sorry, input box, um, it understands that you are a web component. So you just need to say what you're bidirectionally binding on, and everything else will just work. Events. Oh, sorry, um, and that, that comes again from an ES 2015 import. So we're importing that again from NPM, which is pretty awesome, because that's where the internet exists on. So events are really straightforward, plain JavaScript events, and you just write plain functions that respond to them, and they've got the right context of scope. So that's really, really easy. Okay. So let's talk about the pros and cons of that. So firstly, idiomatic JavaScript, which is really, really cool. I like writing imperative code rather than declarative code. Um, JS imports, which are on the standards path, really awesome. They're, they're native browser in um, Chrome, and they're behind Flags in Firefox and Edge. Okay? Um, and they're native in Safari. Uh, NPM, which is basically where the internet goes, right? It's where you download it from. Um, so so that, that's excellent because it's not a, a deprecated source. Um, the templating in this is awful. Um, and this could be seen as a breaking change. It's very much a paradigm shift to the way that they saw web components in the now and historically. Okay? So let's address the first of those two points. They have an elaborate project, experiment, called lit HTML, um, where they're looking at taking JavaScript template literals, that string interpolation, and really taking it to the next level. 
So they reckon that um, JavaScript template, template literals are really, really efficient. They're faster than traditional DOM rendering. They're comparable with React or, or Angular's um, rendering performance. Okay? Um, they're expressive in that inside a template literal, you can just write normal JavaScript code. You can generate this stuff. You can do whatever you want. It's as, it's, you don't have to worry about uh, interpreting the template and trying to come up with your own bespoke compiler, which all of them do. I mean, that's what JSX is, and that's what the Angular compiler does, for example. And the last point is extensible, because this stuff is building off of um, native web features, so you can do whatever you want. You can build higher order template literals. So let's, let's take a look at what they mean by this. And I'm just going to cover this very briefly. Um, Proviso, this stuff doesn't actually work at the moment. It's an experiment. Okay. <laughs> Some smart people are, are thinking about it, but so, so basically, previously we had a static, static method that returned a template that we, we did everything off of. Uh, and we had those square braces, right? Remember? Now we don't have that anymore. We've got something called a tagged literal, which is a standard feature whereby you can take this string interpolation, you can say, well, I'm tagging it with HTML, for example's sake, and HTML is a function. Now, that function gets two parts. It gets the string part, right, the, the template part, and all of the bits and pieces that change. That means that when something changes here and it calls the render method again, you can really efficiently say, oh, that hasn't changed, that hasn't changed, there's just one field that's changed, let's re-render, which gives you high-performance rendering natively in the web. Literally nothing has to change. This whole library of lit HTML is, I think, 1.7 kilobytes. Okay. Um, but again, very, very raw. Very, very raw. Uh, so let's talk about tools, because tools are really important for any ecosystem. So the Polymer CLI is really, really good, really lightweight for building new applications. It doesn't support three yet, but it will. Um, the breaking change, the very massive paradigm shift, they're working hard on a tool called the modulizer, and the modulizer will basically take Polymer 2 and turn it on its head to become Polymer 3, because Polymer 3 at the moment is just a, a facade on top of the Polymer 2 API. There are no breaking changes. There's no code that's different. And then the last part, and this should be the real compelling reason, is webcomponents.org, because webcomponents.org has a thousand or more community contributed components, some by big corporates like Varden. Um, I don't think EA has contributed anything, but the point being that there are things that you can go and you can just say, well, I want to use this higher order component that's got a whole bunch of functionality and is well supported. So talking about where we are, because that's the real elephant in the room from a, a native perspective, we can see that templates well supported across the board, custom elements are all either considering or under development. Um, and this is a little bit dated. I know that Edge is doing work on, t on custom elements. Um, the Shadow DOM is really, really well supported across the board. Um, script modules are basically available everywhere. The only thing the Polymer team is waiting on to pull the trigger on this thing actually becoming an active project, not just a preview, is either Firefox or Edge switching on support from behind the flag. As soon as that happens, this is going mainstream. Uh, and lastly, you can see that HTML ele ele uh, elephants, HTML imports are now, that's recorded, isn't it? <laughs> Damn it. OK, HTML elephants are not going to be supported anyway. I can say it with confidence. Now it's not recording. All right, so, um, so to end it off, um, the, the purpose of the Polymer project is not necessarily to give you a framework that your code is going to live and die in. That's actually not the purpose. The purpose and why these companies have such a massive investment in it is because eventually their code will just be web native. It, it, you can take out the whole framework and it will just be web. Okay. So I think their philosophy, and a philosophy that I think is pretty awesome, is to just use the platform as it is. And everything that you should do should be geared towards building just on top of the platform eventually. So if you want to get a hold of me, please feel free. Um, if you like JavaScript and are curious about it, you can listen to us ramble some more about it at the josie.js meetup group. Shameless plug. Um, awesome. Thank you very much for listening to me and being patient.